Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Josh Epstein, and I'm the marketing specialist here at the TDA Perks Program. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. We'll be focusing on identifying the potential for the most commonly occurring dental emergencies and what preparation for them is adequate and appropriate. Uh, we're going to review the more common medical emergencies, which can occur in the dental office, uh, describe patients who are particularly likely to develop an emergency medical condition in the office, explain the four essential components of preparing for a dental or medical emergency. Uh, today, our presenter is Ted Passanow. He is with Medical Protective and a medical and dental risk manager and former paramedic. Uh, I just want to add that Medical Protective works in conjunction with the TDA Financial Services Insurance Program, and uh, TDA Financial Services uh, Insurance is the only insurance provider that TDA Perks endorses. We do offer over 25 other endorsed vendors, uh, ranging from compliance to HR and personnel management and uh, dental supplies and more. So be sure to come back and visit our Perks website, it's tdaperks.com. Check out all of our partners and, and we archive, archive all of our webinars here as well uh, on the site, as well as our journal articles. So we were probably gonna run about 40 minutes here, um, give or take, and we'll have plenty of time for questions at the conclusion, so I'll ask you to just type in your questions there in the question box, and I'll make sure that we have them all answered. So that said, Ted, ready? Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Josh said, my name is Ted Passano. I'm a senior patient safety and risk consultant with uh, MedPro. Uh, I've been in the field of medical and dental risk management for about 31 years. Uh, including some time as a medical malpractice defense attorney, and I have been with MedPro for the last uh, 13 years. And so uh, prior to that, uh, in a former life, I was a police officer and a police paramedic, so I've had uh, the opportunity to uh, to treat uh, quite a number of, uh, of medical emergencies in the uh, in the pre-hospital uh, in the pre-hospital setting. So I, I hope that the material I share with you today will be of value to you as we prepare for high-risk situations in uh, dental practice. First thing I'd like to do is go over the course objectives. Uh, Josh uh, uh, went through them quickly. I'll just hit upon them again, and then we will move on. It's my goal that at the end of my presentation, you'll be able to list the more common medical emergencies that can occur in the dental office that... Uh, we can identify some patients who are uh, who are at higher risk for a medical emergency, and then we're going to talk about what I consider to be the four essential components or parts uh, in preparing for a medical or dental emergency. Let's start with a case study, and in this case, we have a 74-year-old lady who presents to your practice for routine visit. She didn't even make it back into the uh, operatory, still while in the waiting room. She begins to feel poorly. She soon becomes cool and diaphoretic, uh, classic symptoms of shock. Uh, while her daughter goes up and reports her condition to the office staff, she collapses and very quickly progresses into cardiac arrest. The front office staff has not seen anything like this before. They're completely immobilized. They have no equipment. They have no basic cardiac life support trained staff. And after some delay and checking with the dentist in terms of what should we do, EMS is summoned. EMS does get there. They begin a uh, resuscitation, a code on this patient. They transfer her to the hospital. And while they are able to uh, resuscitate her from a cardiac standpoint, in the meantime, she has suffered profound brain damage and is now in a vegetative state. Um, I wish I could tell you this is a hypothetical case, but it isn't. It's uh, one of the calls that we received on our uh, dental risk management hotline, and uh, we chose to, to include that in this webinar because it illustrates many of the points, uh, many of the vulnerabilities that we're going to talk about today. As you can imagine, this case did not end well either for the patient or the, uh, the dental practice. Now, let's begin with what the kinds of things are that you might encounter in your, your daily practice. Fortunately, medical emergencies in the dental practice are extremely rare. 
uh, unfortunately, because they are extremely aware, in a lot of cases, we see the practice really unprepared for them when they do happen. So let's talk about what are the things that, that we see in the risk management department uh, relating to dentistry that, that can come up. Uh, and first, we're going to look at some treatment-related emergencies. Uh, the first of these is swallowing or aspiration, which means uh, uh, taking the material down into the trachea of foreign material. Uh, this can be uh, parts of a broken tooth, uh, maybe in an extraction where a tooth breaks apart and the portions of that tooth are swallowed or aspirated. It can be uh, whole crowns. Uh, it can be uh, things such as orthodontic wires. And finally, it can be what is becoming more of a problem for us recently, and that is uh, the swallowing or aspiration of part or all of a dental, uh, dental burr, for instance, uh, something that attaches into the handpiece. We're seeing an increasing number of, of these cases, and, uh, and it, you'd be surprised how common uh, this call is. We probably get uh, two or three swallowing or aspiration calls per week. Uh, so it, it's a matter of some concern to us. Uh, next, we have to talk about drug or allergic reactions or uh, drug and alcohol interactions. Um, we do see the occasional case where uh, when we think of uh, allergic reactions, of course, we immediately think of antibiotics, but we do see other cases where the doctor is using a, an anesthetic or something of that sort, maybe a sedative, and for some reason, the patient has an allergic reaction to it. Um, when something in the compound is not agreeing with their body, and so that's got to be dealt with. And of course, when we have the patient who is uh, ingested uh, either a licit or an illicit medication or alcohol uh, prior to coming to your office, now the stage is set for trouble, uh, if, particularly if you get into sedation, but also even with anesthetics. And so that's something that we do see are treatment-related conditions. And then finally, anxiety reactions. Um, I certainly don't have to, to tell you how many patients are active about, are, are anxious about coming to the dental office, but in some of these cases, uh, for instance, um, a brittle diabetic who has a high level of anxiety can easily uh, have the effects of their diabetes uh, kind of go south on them, and we can get into uh, we can get into uh, hyper or hypoglycemia as a result of the anxiety triggering um, the uh, the loss of diabetic uh, homeostasis. Now there are other things that that can occur in your office that really have nothing to do with the dental treatment itself. They just, they can happen in your office because they can happen anywhere. Now, I'm of the opinion that they're somewhat more likely to occur in a healthcare office or facility because uh, persons who are less well tend to go to the doctor, uh, whoever the doctor is, including their dentist, more often because they are less well. And again, these, these uh, conditions occur randomly Statistically, you're just at a greater risk when you, we have the, uh, the healthcare setting. Some of these things are uh, things such as cardiopulmonary events. Uh, primarily, what we're talking about here is a myocardial infarction or a CVA. Uh, people can and do have heart attacks and strokes uh, all the time in all kinds of places, and it can easily happen in your office. Uh, when you think of the fact that you may have uh, 40, 50, 60 people a day moving through your office, depending on its size, uh, just think about the numbers and then think about the likelihood of something like this happening. It really can happen in your dental office, and you need to be prepared for it. Second, diabetic reactions. Again, when we have a brittle diabetic, as you know, diabetes is a balancing act, and when we have a brittle diabetic, it doesn't always take very much to throw them off their, their, their homeostasis and into a point where uh, they are reacting one way or another. So we need to be prepared for that as well. 
Third, syncope. Uh, syncope occurs usually. There's a simple explanation for it. It may not be the first time uh, the person has uh, become uh, syncopal. Maybe they have problems with a post a postural hypotension or something else. But syncope is really easy to deal with when we're prepared. Similarly, seizures. Seizures usually, they, they have a basis such as epilepsy or something similar to that. But I have seen many cases where a person without a, a history of seizure activity spontaneously has a seizure. Again, seizures are easy to, to deal with when they occur, but it does require, uh, it does require a little bit of preparation uh, for when they do occur. And then finally, trauma. Trauma can take uh, two forms. The first, again, has nothing to do with dental practice. Uh, patient slips on the floor and hits their head or something like that. Uh, that's a trauma situation which may require uh, some intervention on your part, but also we can have trauma occurring as the result of your treatment. Um, I personally, several years ago, my dentist lost her grip on the handpiece and during a crown preparation, uh, caught the edge of my tongue with the burr, and that uh, that certainly wasn't an emergency, but it did require a, a fairly prompt uh, trip to the uh, oral surgeon for some stitches. So we can see trauma occurring either as a result of practice or just by virtue of the fact that the environment caused uh, some sort of traumatic event to occur. Now, what I've said to doctors for years is that the only thing better then the lawsuit, which is one, is the lawsuit which was never filed. And in the same way, the only thing better than a medical emergency which, which was properly handled is the medical emergency which never occurred. It's all a matter of prevention. We can't prevent everything, but there are things we can do to really, one, lower the risk of it happening, and two, if it does happen, make sure that it goes as smoothly and it has as good an outcome as possible. That's what I call prevention. Now, when we do prevention, one of the first things we wanna do is some good pretreatment screening. There are certain patients that just, uh, because of their circumstances, they are high risk from a clinical standpoint. For instance, elderly and frail patients. You know that these patients their, their homeostatic state is so precarious that it really doesn't take much at all to put them into a crisis situation. Uh, I have seen many elderly people who all they have to do is pick up a little bug or something of that sort that you or I would just shake off, which can just be really serious for them. That certainly carries over into the receipt of any sort of medical services, including uh, dentistry. Second, chronically or recently ill patients. Patients with um, pretty significant cancer, patients with COPD, um, unstable diabetics, uh, persons with lupus, HIV, uh, various conditions like that, chronic conditions, they can really be, these comorbid conditions can be real complications uh, for you when you're trying to do uh, dentistry and, uh, and trying to assure that this patient is stable and suitable to receive uh, the dental care they need. We can also be talking about recently ill patients. For instance, let's say a person is just coming off of uh, uh, chemotherapy for uh, cancer, something of that sort. Um, they are probably going to be more vulnerable uh, from the standpoint of just the stress that's been on their body and so on. And so we want to um, uh, we want to be mindful of the fact that that they may be clinically higher risk patients than uh, than your other patients, your typical patient you have. Next, those who have had recent significant medical treatment, again chemotherapy or something like that, but also think of something such as uh, recent uh, large joint replacement. Uh, we are replacing hips and knees and even shoulders and so on all the time now. Uh, just because we're doing it frequently doesn't mean it isn't still a big procedure. 
Um, our orthopedic colleagues have got this down to a science pretty well, but it is still quite an invasion on the body, and it, it has the potential to make the person more unstable, more vulnerable to uh, getting into trouble when they receive uh, any sort of medical treatment, including dental treatment. Next, histories of substance abuse or suspicion of recent injection, uh, ingestion. Certainly a history of substance abuse, especially that is still ongoing, does not make the patient an unsuitable candidate for dental treatment. But you can see that you know we have obvious concerns, especially when we're dealing with some of the illicit drugs, such as meth and so on. You're gonna be dealing with very potentially complicated conditions here, and the substance abuse can be just a major contributor to how complicated this case can be. Secondly, ingestion. Uh, traditionally, the ingestion has been alcohol, but now we see far more ingestion prior to treatment of um, uh, marijuana, mainly. And so I personally feel that before you commence treatment on any patient, a question you should ask them is, what have you consumed in the last 12 hours? Uh, I'm not here to judge you. I'm not going to narc you out, but I really need to know what you have put into your body for the last 12 hours so that I can uh, be sure that I'm not, uh, I'm not giving you anything which is going to cause you any problems or any distress or anything of that sort. That's an important question to ask, and, and I've seen some cases where uh, recent ingestion uh, has combined, for instance, with, um, with conscious sedation has produced some, some very complicated cases and some really tragic results in a couple of cases. Finally, patients you've had problems with in the past, whatever the form of the problem was, um, I personally feel that the previous behavior is to some degree uh, likely to be predictive of future behavior. And so when you've had patients with anything from um, uh, emotional issues to uh, a body that that didn't really respond to treatment as we would expect them to, didn't heal properly or whatever. It could be Munchausen's, it could be anything. Uh, patients you've had problems with in the past, I hope that their files are flagged so that when they're back for treatment, we can review what those problems were and be especially vigilant in, uh, in screening them for um, whether they're suitable to receive treatment today. What to check? I personally believe you should be checking blood pressure, heart rate, temperature, and if the patient is a diabetic and has a glucometer, please have them check their, uh, their glucose level prior to the commencement of treatment. You may save yourself some real problems in the next half hour or 45 minutes if their glucose level is not good. Uh, I know a lot of practices are checking uh, blood pressure and heart rate. Uh, I know that, that in, uh, in my dentist practice, that is, uh, that is common practice. They don't check temperature, but um, sometimes there is an infection going on that the person may not even be aware of uh, that their temperature may indicate. Uh, my daughter this week uh, was just diagnosed with strep. She's in her 40s. She was diagnosed with strep and really wasn't, wasn't feeling bad at all. Uh, so, you know, this, this can happen. Um, one other thing that, that I'm going to suggest to you is the use of pulse oximetry. Now, by no means is pulse oximetry uh, the standard of care in dentistry, and I wouldn't want to imply that it is. However, in my opinion, it should be. This is a simple tool. It's not expensive, exceedingly simple to use. You just clip it on an index finger but it gives you very important information at a time when you can take steps to make sure that the patient doesn't decompensate to the point that it becomes emergent. Uh, many years ago, anesthesiologists were very skeptical of pulse oximetry, but now uh, you can't possibly get a medical procedure done without them using pulse oximetry. And I think that um, in dentistry, we can borrow from our medical colleagues here, uh, borrow the wisdom of using it. Uh, that is my opinion. Now, 
let's talk about what the goals actually are in treating uh, medical emergencies in the dental office. Um, during the years I was a paramedic, I think people honestly sort of viewed us as doctors in the field that were there to, uh, to make people well, and, and that really wasn't true. Uh, the first goal for us as a paramedic or for you as a dentist uh, dealing with an emergency is simply to provide stabilizing care. You're not there to make the patient better. What you're there to do is to provide a type and a level of care which prevents the patient from getting any worse before we can get them into the hands of the physicians who can more thoroughly work them up and diagnose them and do whatever needs to be done, whether it's a cardiologist or a surgeon or whoever it may be. But the goal is simply to stop this patient who is really hitting in a, in a negative direction to stop that and just get them to a point of stability long enough to get them to medical care. Practically, for you as a dentist having an emergency in your office, the goal is to get the patient into the hands of EMS as quickly as possible. EMS are the folks who have been uh, trained in this. Uh, they're equipped to deal with these things. Uh, in all likelihood, the emergency that you're experiencing in your office, they have seen many times before. They know how to deal with it. What we want to do is get the patient into their hands as smoothly and efficiently and quickly as possible. That's the best thing for the patient, and in the end, it's, it's the best thing for you. But again, what I want to emphasize, the goal is not to attempt to make the patient well. We're just trying to, um, to, to uh, interrupt their downward spiral long enough to get them into the hands of uh, medical practitioners who can, uh, who, who can make them well. Now, what is needed? I think there's four parts that are involved in preparing for medical emergencies in the dental office. The first is we need a plan. We definitely need a plan. Secondly, we're gonna need some medications and equipment. Third, we're gonna need training. And fourth, aftercare. And aftercare is probably the one that is thought of the least. So let's talk about each of these. First, we'll talk about our plan. Obviously, it needs to be written. It doesn't need to be a book. It needs to be something which is uh, uh, precise enough and yet simple enough to be easily understood by whoever is reading it. It needs to be written. It can be revised if necessary, but uh, we do need a written plan. Believe me, a medical emergency is not the time when you want to be thinking on your feet. You want to have a plan, and those who are in emergency services, as I was for a number of years, we would spend a very large amount of our time planning for what could happen so that, again, you're not, you're not thinking on your feet. When something happens, we have a plan, and we simply execute the plan. That's when we get good results, okay? The plan needs to be prominently posted. Uh, it should be in the break room. Uh, you can send it to people as a Word document so they can have it on their desktop. Uh, however you want to do it, however, wherever you want to do it, uh, we want the plan to be out there as much as possible, sort of like the posters you'll see in the break room about how to, how to help a person who's choking. The, the plan should be just that prominent, so it's easy to get to, and it should be periodically reviewed by you and everybody in your office. I personally recommend that um, review of the emergency plan and review of the practices HIPAA policies should certainly be part of uh, each employee's annual review. It's a great time to go over that and, and to walk through, you know, talk through the plan as well to be sure that everybody understands it. Because honest to goodness, when an emergency occurs, what we know is that People do what they're trained to do. That's the way it works. Now, let's talk about assignments. Within the plan, certain persons in the office are going to have certain responsibilities. And it's best if those responsibilities, those assignments, 
are understood out front. The first, of course, well, the first thing I want to talk about is the fact that when we write our plan, the assignments are by position, not by person. Let's say you're a small dental office, uh, a dentist, and maybe five or six employees total. We wouldn't want to put together a plan that says, Judy does this and Betty does that. Because as luck will have it, when the emergency occurs, Judy is out with the flu and Betty's on vacation. Instead, what we do is we assign assignments by person. The receptionist does this, the assistant does this, the hygienist does this, so on and so on, so that the person understands that their position indicates or mandates that they do this part in executing the total treatment plan. Obviously, two to three persons are gonna be needed for patient care, depending on what the condition is. If the patient is simply feeling poorly and seems to be getting worse, uh, we're probably not gonna need three people right there to, uh, to uh, be ministering to them. Uh, it may just be a matter of taking a break, maybe giving them a little orange juice or something of that sort, maybe changing their position for a few minutes, whatever the case may be. On the other hand, if this person has uh, progressed into full-blown cardiac arrest, which uh, I have had those calls as well, um, it's gonna probably take three persons devoted strictly to patient care to adequately keep up with everything that is going on. Second person, uh, a second assignment is EMS contact. I usually recommend this being the receptionist. This person is the one who's gonna call EMS, they're gonna give EMS their cell phone number and have their cell phone on them in case EMS is having any trouble locating the, the office or the site. Uh, they're gonna be the ones that are standing out front where they tell EMS they're gonna be. They're gonna be standing out front, waving their arms, making it as easily as easy as possible for EMS to locate them and to get to, get to the patient. Uh, depending on your circumstances, uh, you may have to look at the office and say, where are the wider doors, where are the wider hallways, anticipating that a patient on a stretcher is gonna be coming out there. If you're in a medical building, it may involve uh, locating the most suitable elevator and locking that elevator out of service so that it's available for EMS. These are things you're gonna to have to um, work through on an individual basis based on your circumstances, but this will all be responsibilities of the EMS contact to again facilitate EMS getting to the patient. Uh, they call and they ask, escort EMS to uh, the patient or the scene of the emergency. The next thing is a scribe. One of the things that makes medical emergencies difficult to deal with is the fact that when things are going on at the scene, it is very difficult to provide an accurate chronology of what has occurred. Uh, when it's possible, uh, the ideal situation is for a person to be there as a scribe. Uh, if, if you ever had the chance to be in the emergency department where they are running a code, you will see one person over in the corner who is not uh, participating in the treatment of the patient, who is not suggesting anything in terms of treatment, but they are simply writing. They're scribing the events so that there's an accurate chronology of what has occurred for purposes of doing our record keeping. Uh, the scribe will document vital signs and symptoms. They'll document the treatment rendered and how the patient responded to that treatment. Uh, any medications administered, uh, you know, what the dose, all of that sort of thing. And what is ideal is if the scribe actually has a form that they can actually use uh, for purposes of recording all this, being sure they capture all this information and it's recorded in an organized, uh, organized form. I currently am working on a development of a, um, a, an emergency documentation form, which I anticipate being, uh, being available to uh, the, the TDA members in not too distant the future. And then finally, the other part is family support. Um, what I recommend here is this is a good thing for the office manager 
to deal with if the patient came with any other family members or that sort of thing it's probably best if they be uh, escorted to a, a a sequestered place such as a conference room or a uh, maybe even the manager's office until uh, the the situation is somewhat resolved they can be updated periodically but we're not leaving them in the waiting room kind of wondering and talking amongst themselves what's going on and so on and also the family support person may have to provide some explanation and um, and uh, reassurance to persons who are there waiting uh, that you know yes we do have an emergency going on however it, you know it's under control however you know our uh, our our schedule is going to be off whack we may very well have to reschedule you because of what's going on here and so on um, I think the the practice manager is oftentimes a very good person to uh, to take care of uh, that part of uh, of the uh, the process now let's talk about medications and equipment let me begin by saying I am a minimalist. Uh, I am not one who feels you should have the big kit with 30 drugs in it, that you should have all sorts of complicated, uh, expensive equipment, uh, such as uh, defibrillator. Well, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, I recommend that, that it be kept pretty simple. Whatever you have, it needs to be inventoried and checked uh, for good working condition, and I recommend that occur every six months. Now, that's not going to occur unless it is somebody's job. There needs to be a dedicated person who part of their job description is that they maintain the, the medications and the equipment, and they make sure everything is serviceable and ready to go at a moment's notice. That's just part of their job. To do that say the the first Wednesday of the year and the first Wednesday in July something like that where they actually take the time go through everything document that they have gone through everything so that your equipment is ready to be used we know where it is it's ready to go we're not dusting the dust off it uh, when we actually need it again I am a minimalist I recommend a, a pretty minimal amount of, of, of uh, of medications and equipment but it's essential that you know how to use what you have that's not time to be pulling out the manual and trying to figure out where does this hook to this okay so know how to use what you have this is a list of medications suggested by the ADA uh, for preparing for medical emergencies and I like it uh, I think everything we really need is here and um, if you have these things, you're probably adequately prepared for the, the vast majority of medical emergencies that could arise uh, in your office. Uh, pretty simple stuff, uh, pretty simple to use, uh, but uh, you can accomplish a lot in terms of stabilizing a patient's condition with these, uh, with these medications. Now, what about equipment? Let's talk about what I recommend as equipment. First, an automatic, an AED, an automatic external defibrillator. You need to have one. Uh, your church has one. Your grocery store has one. You in healthcare, you should have one as well. Uh, they are simple to use. Uh, you can't hardly use these things long because they just won't, they just won't function until you've used it properly. And I can tell you that when the patient is in a cardiac condition, typically what we call ventricular fibrillation, the only thing that's going to make them well is a shock. And that's all they need, but that's what they need. And that's what the AED does. Again, very simple to use. Uh, there's, there's no danger to uh, the person's handling it or so on. Uh, and it, it really has, has proven to be very beneficial to many patients. So you need to have an AED. Secondly, you need a D-tank of oxygen with appropriate tubing and mass. A D-tank of oxygen is about, oh, 30, 32 inches long. It's not heavy, it's easily portable and so on, but it has enough oxygen to get you through 
your emergency. It's not likely you're going to need more oxygen than, than a D tank. So I recommend you have one of those. And of course, one of the things that the designated person needs to do is to make sure that it's full, to make sure that it hasn't been left partially open and it is all leaked out. I've seen that happen more than once and that is not helpful. Next, an ambu bag. This is the, uh, the, the rubbery material, the bag that we use to uh, ventilate people. Uh, it, it replaces mouth-to-mouth -mouth, uh, uh, ventilation in a CPR type situation, and you can also uh, supplement an ambu bag with uh, oxygen so that you're ventilating the patient with 100% oxygen. Now I'll warn you that it takes a little bit of practice to get to the point where you can use an AMBU bag uh, effectively. You can't just pick it up and use it. Somebody's gonna have to show you the correct technique for putting the mask to the mouth and nose in such a way that you get a good seal and you're delivering an appropriate amount of oxygen to the, uh, to the patient. But, you know, very useful uh, to have that. Next, simply a set of oropharyngeal airways. These are nothing more than little uh, basically plastic blocks that are curved that go into the throat. They keep the tongue up off the bottom of the throat so that we can move air down into the lungs where we need to. A suction unit. Now, you do need suction and you need something different than your chair side suction. Your chair side suction is great for the water and the saliva and so on that you're used to, to taking out of the patient, but this suction unit that you need you need the industrial type size suction that is going to deal with the vomit that you're liable to get uh, in a patient who goes into full cardiac arrest. Uh, almost certainly one of the first things they do when they go into cardiac arrest is they vomit and that vomit needs to be gotten out before it goes down into the lungs. That's what a suction unit does. It does not have to be big or sophisticated. I have seen suction units that you actually use by just squeezing a lever and that provides the suction. And then there's a quite a large bore tube that's put into the patient's mouth to get that stuff out. Uh, very simple to use and, uh, and very adequate for your needs. And then finally, a bite block. If you run into a situation where a patient is going into a seizure, if you can get a bite block in between the molars, not the front teeth, but you know, in between the molars, you can prevent a lot of damage to the patient's teeth from the clenching or even the biting off the end of the tongue, that sort of thing as a result of a seizure. Now, training. This is the next step. First, BCLS, Basic Cardiac Life Support or CPR. Train everybody in the office, whether they're clinical or not, the billing person, the office manager, the receptionist, train everybody. There's two reasons for this. One, if you've ever actually done CPR on someone, you know that it is exhausting. And after four to five minutes, maybe a little longer if you're in good shape, you're gonna be ready to turn chest compressions over to somebody else for a while. You need enough people there in the office to do that so that you've got somebody to turn the chest compressions over to. Now, if you happen to be next door to the fire station, you're not going to have to do CPR very long. If, on the other hand, you're in a rural area, possibly with a volunteer ambulance service, keep in mind you could be stuck for 20 to 30 minutes before EMS is there and ready to take over the patient. Uh, you, hopefully, you're going to be able to provide good care in the meantime. And if that means CPR, you're going to need more than one person who knows how to do it. Uh, or I can, I can guarantee you the rescuer is not going to be able to sustain CPR for that length of time. But there's a second reason, and that is the people that you train may very well need this skill in their personal life. My daughter-in-law, who is a dentist, of course was trained in uh, BCLS in, in, uh, in dental school, and when she was bathing their two little girls one day, uh, our one-year-old, she slipped down under the water, she aspirated some water, she went into laryngospasm, and she locked up tight and wasn't breathing. And Shannon, because of her training, was able to get Ella breathing in a short period of time, absolutely no harm to her. 
this, could, this is a skill that you may need uh, anywhere. And so I recommend everybody in the office be trained. I recommend that everybody maintain uh, current certification. The easiest thing to do is to train everybody at the same time so that everybody's up for recertification at the same time. And we just do that on a Saturday morning. We, we get our, our CPR certification. This is what almost never happens, is to run some simulations. It is one thing to put together a plan. It's a whole other thing to execute that plan, even in a simulation, and to see how it goes, okay? What running a simulation is going to do is to help you to identify vulnerabilities, and for everybody involved in the plan to provide input to say, what works, what doesn't, how can we do things differently, and so on. As I mentioned earlier, uh, I was a uh, paramedic for a number of years and, and spent um, most of the second year after we had covered the didactic material in the field doing simulated cases where we could make these mistakes without it having any permanent harm and where we learned to look for the pitfalls and the problems that come from the particular situation with which you're faced. It's amazing how well simulations help you to identify vulnerabilities. And frankly, when an emergency then occurs, people are a lot more calm because they've seen this before, even if it's been in a simulation. Solicit the input of your local EMS. Most of the EMS providers I know are more than happy to come to your office, say on a Saturday, run you through CPR certification in the morning, and then run some simulations in the afternoon. They show you what their equipment is, what they need from you to help you with your plan, and to, to make things just go smoothly so that when it happens, everybody knows what's going on. And again, people do what they're trained. Finally, family support. Identify any persons who accompanied the patient to the appointment, escort them to a private area, update them as possible as we know more, uh, including to the point where the patient is leaving for the hospital. And then finally, reassure anyone else in the common areas who may be concerned. Aftercare, I'll cover this quickly, but it's important. Debrief when possible. When this is done, when the ambulance is gone, the patient's on their way, you're gonna to need to take a break and chat about this. Maybe in the break room, maybe in the picnic table outside, wherever it is, but people are going to need to talk and they're going to need to come down like any other crisis situation. Allow time for debriefing. You may have to cancel the rest of your appointments for the day and just allow people to just uh, decompress. Follow up obviously with the patient and family. In many situations I've seen the dentist actually goes with the patient to the hospital. That's a great arrangement when it occurs because then the dentist can provide the emergency physician with just a ton of information about what occurred even prior to EMS arriving. Uh, maybe we have scribed some good notes we can turn over to the emergency doc. It really helps them a lot to really gives them a, 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 a big lead in terms of dealing with this patient. And finally, be prepared for the fact that this is a traumatic and emotionally traumatic situation and PTSD is very common. PTSD may occur immediately. It may be right then that people crash emotionally or a reaction can be delayed by days, weeks, or even months. Uh, I, during my police career, was involved in a quite a uh, tra traumatic situation, and honestly, I did not have an emotional meltdown until uh, several months later, uh, but I did have one. So be prepared for an immediate or a delayed stress reaction. Again, the bottom line is the key to a good outcome is preparation. People do as they're trained. Uh, things work when we plan for them, and you, if you put a little bit of time and energy into preparation, the likelihood of a good outcome for your patient 
and therefore for you are, are greatly increased. And so with that, uh, Josh, if we have any questions, uh, I am ready for them. Yeah, okay, and thanks so much for that, Ted. And I had a, a couple of folks kind of pop in here um, just wondering if there was going to be a copy available, and there will be. Uh, all these rec uh, webinars are recorded, and we'll send them out via email, um, through our blast email, and as well as we'll keep them on our, our website in our archived area, and um, you can definitely come back and, and check it out. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, I do see a question coming in here, and it's more of the about the preventative. So, uh, Ted, how would you prevent a patient from swallowing or aspirating a dental bar, uh, dental burr? I'm sorry. Well, that's an excellent question, and um, uh, and I'm glad you asked it. Um, one of the things there are usually one of two reasons that a dental burr uh, ends up being swallowed or aspirated, and that is that either the handpiece has become defective and it's not properly gripping the burr, or secondly, what we're seeing is that the practice is reusing um, burrs that are intended for single use, and when that occurs, the burr has not been um, designed to withstand the temperature and so on of sterilization, and so it weakens them, and they tend to break when they are reused. What we recommend to avoid any uh, any risk of a problem with the burr is really three things. First, when the burr is put in the handpiece, simply grip it and try to pull it out, see if it's nice and firm in there. Secondly, um, before going into the oral cavity, run the handpiece for a few seconds outside of the patient's mouth. Now I'm hoping, I'm assuming and I'm hoping that everybody has, um, has eye protection on uh, at this point, but uh, because if there is something wrong with the burr, and for instance, it does separate, it becomes a high-speed missile, and so we want to take and run it for a few seconds closer to the floor or something like that, down from the patient and the caregiver's face, so there's minimal risk if it should separate that it's going to hit and injure anybody. And then, of course, the final thing is, obviously, don't reuse um, single-use burrs. So that's the way I would recommend that we handle that um, that situation. And, and Josh, I'll just mention as well that if any of our listeners have uh, specific questions that they'd like to discuss, uh, I'm more than happy to discuss those questions with them, whether or not they are AmendPro insured. And my direct line is 517-676-8655. And I am on Eastern time. Okay. Yeah, and, and and also I'll be happy to. I'm going to reach out to everyone that's been on the webinar as well, and I'm going to make sure that they have your information. Um, Good. After Good. the fact, and and they'll have mine as well. But we've got a few other questions here, uh, and it looks like the first was answered. Um, so, uh, can we use oxygen from the nitrous apparatus? I'm sorry, I don't understand. I it didn't was, understand well, the, the question. question I have here is: Can we use oxygen? From the nitrous apparatus? Yes, you can. You okay. certainly can. Uh, as long as it's pure oxygen. Uh, you know, if you can completely uh, shut off the, uh, the, the nitrous aspect of it, there's no reason that you can't use that oxygen. That would be fine. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, and you're welcome. Um, so basically, uh, this is something to do with the ADA website, and I can maybe send this information out and just do a little uh, investigative work on my own. But uh, do you know, Ted, if there's a list of medications recommended for an emergency drug kit? I, did you? I'm not sure if you touched on that with that sheet that you had. The the uh, document that I displayed um, uh, is, to my knowledge, the most current ADA recommendations on medications, and there's uh, there's about ten medications listed there. But if you, I'm sure if you go to the ADA website, you could also uh, locate it. Yeah. Uh, okay, another question here. Um, actually, uh, do you recommend having uh, an uh, EpiPen for use? Yes, uh, certainly do. Um, when 
if a patient were to suffer an anaphylactic reaction, that is exactly what is needed. Um, um, it, it's, it's sort of like the AED. That's all they need, but they need that. They need, uh, they need, need you to use it. And you follow the directions. If I recall correctly, normally when you use an EpiPen, it comes in two parts and you do administer uh, both doses. And if you use an EpiPen, it is, it is uh, mandatory that the patient go to the hospital um, for two reasons. One being that the effects of the EpiPen are fairly short, but secondly, the patient needs to be worked up uh, to be sure that, that they're stable and there's not gonna be a recurrence uh, at some later time. So, uh, yes, I, I, and I believe the EpiPen is one of the things listed on the, uh, the ADA form that we just made reference to. So yes, definitely have one. Okay. And I, I guess, I don't know, maybe some folks, this could be awkward, but you know, how would they handle a patient who in their judgment is too unstable to undergo treatment? I think that it, that very simply, uh, the patient may not be happy, but we have to put the patient's welfare over their happiness. And if there's any indication that the patient is not suitable for treatment in our office or suitable for treatment today, we just need to we just need to be firm in saying, "I'm sorry, we can't take care of this today." Uh, in some cases, it may be that the patient is uh, unstable enough that we need to do treatment in a hospital, an ASC, or maybe even in the oral surgery um, uh, context where they are more set up for emergencies if the patient doesn't do well. In other situations, the patient's condition may be temporary, uh, let's say following a large joint surgery, and we're just not feeling good about uh, the patient overall and we want to get medical clearance from either the orthopedic surgeon or from the patient's family doctor. And so we just simply say, look, let's just, uh, let's just reschedule for uh, a week or 10 days. Give me a chance to talk to your, your, uh, your physician uh, and make sure that your body is, is 100% ready to, uh, you know, to, uh, uh, to have this treatment. Now, there are situations where uh, it's emergency treatment, um, you know, bleeding, that sort of thing that, that just has to be treated right now. And we're just going to have to deal with that. But fortunately, those, uh, you know, those emergencies that require us to get outside our normal um, uh, analytical parameters, uh, fortunately, those are pretty rare. Okay, uh, interesting question coming up. So uh, because of recent changes in, I guess, Texas mandate, um, basically uh, mandating emergency drills uh, to be held and documented. Uh, again, this is kind of referring back to the ADA uh, and having any forms and documents to help that out. So uh, unless you want to mention something about that, Ted, I, I know that we can have folks go to the ADA.org or you could actually, you know, call up here at the TDA and I know that, um, there are folks that can that can help you with that, but Ted, if you wanted to add something there, um, well, I, I to be honest with you, I am not familiar with the Texas right. mandate at all. Uh, you know, being a, a consultant for our insurance across the country, uh, I can't really keep up with individual states' mandates. But what I'm hearing is music to my ears uh, because um, I'm convinced that simulations are one of the best things we can do. And one of the things that we do uh, probably less often just because of uh, what I often refer to as the tyranny of the urgent. But yeah, by all means, uh, do some simulations. Uh, if Texas has mandated uh, simulations be run, there, look around a little bit. There may be some material available that would help you with simulations, maybe uh, uh, descriptions of some cases and some tips on how to stage them and so on, so that uh, so that it's uh, there's no sense in reinventing the wheel. So that's what I would do is look around a little bit, and maybe you guys there at the TDA have or have access to some uh, materials to support that. Yeah, definitely. And if anyone's interested in you know following up with me regarding this type of thing, you know, uh, again, 
I'm here with the perks program, but you know, my priority is making sure that everyone has the information they need so I can make sure that um, I get with the correct and uh, appropriate folks over here to, and get you that information. We'd be happy to help. Um, okay, it doesn't look like we have any more questions. Um, again, I'm going to send this, we're going to send this webinar out. So, you know, you'll have an opportunity to come back and if you missed any of it, um, there's there's going to be, you know, obviously an opportunity to uh, review it and even, you know, pass it on to any of your colleagues or your staff and um, so that should be great. But Ted, did you want to add anything before we leave? No, I, I thank everybody for attending today. I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that you took the time to listen into this. Um, dealing with these situations, uh, at least after the fact, on a regular basis, um, we sometimes get a little frustrated and, and, and say, boy, if just a little more had been done to prepare for this, uh, it would have been a lot better for the doctor and the patient. And that, in the end, is what we're trying to achieve here is uh, uh, quality and, and safe patient care. So thanks, everybody, for your attention. Yeah, and, and again, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you can reach me at uh, josh at tda.org. And, you know, you just call me here at the TDA if you'd like, 512-443-3675. And I'd be happy to help you with anything related to perks as and well as uh, the TDA. And uh, we thank you for being a TDA member. Uh, come back and see us at our website, tdaperks.com. And uh, hope to see you again at our next webinar next month. So I want to wish everyone a happy and safe holiday. And Ted, thank you so much for your time. It's very informative. And, um, well, everyone take care.